All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. I'm Nikki from the Heartbeat Team, and to, thank you everyone for attending today's session. All right, so let's begin. And today's session is in collaboration with Ojoy Care Services, and they'll be here to share on the topic of near hoarding. So um, before, just before we start, if you have any questions that you'd like to raise or share with uh, the rest of our audience today, you can just leave them in the chat box and we'll answer them from there. And yeah. so just to introduce us, we're from the Heartbeat team and we are hosting online webinars during the to allow the community to be more aware of social issues in Singapore as well as uh, to see how youth or as a member of the community can play our part to make this community a better place. Right, so these are three of our main uh, areas that we are focusing on to contribute, collaborate and catalyze. So for contribution, we want to create a safe space for social conversations as well as discussion. That's why we invite community partners on board to share the initiatives and what they do with everyone else. For collaboration, we hope to promote, um, where we hope that youth and our member, the community partners can come together and try to uh, see what they can co-create or make something together for the community. And of course, we hope to catalyze uh, youth, all our youth to create a social impact within their own communities. So later I'll share a bit more. Uh, from our previous session, we actually did have some youth that stepped forward to co-create some uh, activities for seniors. So it's, it's a really heartening site and we hope to share their initiative with everyone. Right, so without any further ado, uh, let's introduce our speakers from the team from Ojoy and they'll be sharing with us on the topic of hoarding. Right, so thank you and uh, let's begin. Hear me? Ah, uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, welcome to an exciting one and a half hour talk on hoarding. We are very honoured to be invited by Volunteer SG Hubby uh, to give a talk on this topic. Um, so let me introduce uh, Ojoy a little bit before we start. Um, Ojoy is an organization that provides counseling and clinical case management services to older adults and their families. Some of the common issues include grief and loss, relationship problems, and caregiver stress. And 80% of our work with seniors are home-based. We also provide counseling to adults 18 years and above with mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. Counseling sessions with adults usually takes place at our center in Kalang. Of course, now during COVID-19, we provide counselling mainly via phone, WhatsApp video calls or Zoom. Okay, we also train and work with volunteers who provide one-to-one -one home based emotional support to seniors at risk of social isolation. Currently, we have more than 50 active volunteers with Ojoy serving close to 50 seniors and their ages range from early 20s to 70s. So we have students, working adults, as well as retirees. And sometimes we will request help from our volunteers to help to declutter homes of our seniors. And lastly, we also provide health-oriented aging activities every Monday to Friday mornings to seniors residing in the Upper Boon King area to keep them healthy and happy. So today the talk is on hoarding and is presented for, um, by two of us. I'm Yap Ping and uh, this is Fiona. Hi everyone. <laughs> yeah, okay. We are both counsellors at Ojoy and I have been with Ojoy for more than 10 years and Fiona for more than 6 years. So we have come across a fair share of cases with hoarding issues and hopefully our sharing will be beneficial to you. Okay, um, today's talk there are two main sections. The first part is sharing with you our understanding of hoarding and what it is, how we assess hoarding, and what are some of the interventions we do to help those with hoarding issues? And the second part is sharing with you a case study. So Fiona will be sharing the case study with you after me. It is our hope that with this talk, uh, you can better understand about hoarding and how to help those with hoarding issues. As I understand from Nikki, our organizer, our organizer there are more than 100 sign up, signups for this talk, and we are actually very moved. That means that hoarding is a topic that is very important for many of you. So a lot of us know about hoarding 
two newspaper articles. Um, some of you may have neighbors who hoard or even family members who hoard. And hoarding creates a big concern for our community, mainly because of the risk involved, especially fire hazard. So some seniors may even die from the fire that occur in a flat filled with clutter. Or sometimes um, an elderly may die alone in their flat and when he's discovered, they find that he has a hoarding habit. If you look at the flats in the newspaper articles, right, like for example this one, it is completely filled with um, clutter all the way to the brim. And you may even ask yourself, how can someone live inside a flat like this, right? Um, how come they cannot keep their flat clean and clutter free? You know, how can we help them before disaster like this strikes, right? Okay, um, some facts on hoarding. One IMH study in 2010 found that one in 50 people in Singapore will display hoarding behavior in their lifetime. That means that, you know, within this audience, if we have 100 people here, at least two of us will display hoarding behavior in our lifetime. Okay, so is this not that rare? Uh, a lot of us like to hoard things, especially during times of uncertainties. So if you think back on our recent supermarket long queues during the start of COVID-19, you can understand that when we feel insecure, we want to hoard. You know, like toilet papers are considered good item to hoard, according to some psychologists, because they are relatively inexpensive, so we can buy a lot. Um, they are big enough to take up space in our homes and visible enough to give us some psychological comfort. They kind of make us feel that we are more prepared for any impending disasters. You know, so for many of our seniors, life has been hard for them, you know, especially those who have gone through World War, gone through the start of Singapore, you know, economic recession and things like that. So life itself is a challenge for them and clutter is like a security blanket for them. Okay, the second point is, although most reports point to elderly with hoarding behavior, hoarding can start at a younger age. Okay, oops, sorry. Yeah. So, um, there are some uh, studies that says that hoarding can start as young as 11 to 15. Um, in my work, I've come across people who hoard in their 20s, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, you know. Um, a few of them have parents who hoard. So basically, the whole family hoards and they continue with the habit. Um, one of them suffers from a mental illness called OCD or obsessive or compulsive disorder. Okay, so basically it starts with um, keeping a few things and then it gradually spirals out of control. And this doesn't happen overnight, okay? The pictures that you saw in the newspaper, it doesn't happen overnight. It normally takes years for the clutter to become as bad as what we see. And we see more reports on seniors with clutter, but sometimes it is not so much that they have a typical hoarding disorder, but that they have become too old and weak to clear the clutter. So there's a difference between um, people who have clutter and people who hoard. And later I will you know, emphasize more on the difference. Okay, it is more obvious in one or two room HDB flats due to their smaller floor areas and in which the elderly lives alone or with family members who permits hoarding or who also hoards. So does it mean that there's no hoarding in three room, four room, five room flats? There's no hoarding in landed properties? Uh, no, actually, it just takes longer for the hoarding to reach a point whereby it affects the lives of those living inside, uh, for it to make an impact on their health, uh, for it to cause certain risks like fire hazard, and for the community to become aware and to step in to intervene. Okay, I have been to at least two fire room flats in which there are hoarding issues. Um, they are not referred to us because of their hoarding, they are referred to us for some other problems. And when we do home visits, then we find out about their hoarding behavior. So um, the first one is a couple in their 40s and 50s. They have two teenage sons. The father has young onset dementia, and the mother suffers from traumatic brain injury after a road traffic accident. So unfortunately, um, both of them became unable to organize things due to impairments in their brain. So when you go in, there are piles of clothes on the sofa and the bed. There are piles of books and medications on the table. Um, you can't sit on the sofa to watch TV unless you move some clothes away. You can't sit at the dining table to eat, so the kids have to eat in their rooms. 
And then the second case, the five-room flat belongs to an elderly couple in their 80s and their son in his 50s, and the son has a psychiatric condition. So the main clutter is in the dining room. Um, there are boxes piled all the way up to the ceiling. Okay? This is a five-room flat. The dining room is pretty big. It's an old kind of five-room flat. Uh, so can you imagine how many boxes there are? It's piled up to the ceiling, leaving only one narrow walkway, sufficient for the width of a walking frame, uh, which the elderly mother actually uses for her you know, ambulation. So not just there are boxes, right? There are also S hooks hanging on the boxes. And then there were plastic bags that were hang, uh, hung from the S hooks on the boxes. So when I first entered the house, as I walked through the narrow walkway, I was enclosed on both sides, all the way to the ceiling like an arch. And all the time I was very frightened because uh, anytime the boxes could fall on me. So um, can you imagine the risk it, it is for the elderly parents? Okay, there could be an avalanche. Okay, and if you ask me what are in the boxes, they're actually church pamphlets. So the son distributes them as part of his job. Um, but how did it get to be so many boxes? Um, maybe the son um, doesn't distribute them as fast as he's supposed to. Maybe the church delivers the pamphlets to him and the son is unable to say no. Uh, I do not have the, all the answers to that because um, the son was subsequently arrested on the streets one day and sent to a psychiatric institution. Yeah. So besides the son, right, the elderly father also hoards. Okay, he hoards um, high-class things like antiques, and he also hoards newspapers and notebooks with his recordings on important world events. So basically, he wants to leave all of them to his grandchildren as part of his legacy. Yeah. So, um, so basically the thing is, uh, usually hoarding can be found in places where elderly live alone or live with family members who permits hoarding or who also hoards. Um, in cases whereby family members do not permit the hoarding, there may not be any clutter, but the relationships between the family member and the person who hoards is very strained. Okay, I have met family members who, because they are so frustrated with the clutter, they throw away things without asking permission from the person who hoards. And in some cases, the hoarder may become very aggressive towards the family members when they found out. Okay, so it is actually not easy to live with someone who hoards and you don't. Um, I understand from some of the questions that were already asked um, before this talk that uh, some of you may live in a situation like this whereby you have family members who hoard and you want to know how to help them. So um, I would suggest that uh, eventually you may be able to call us or meet us for a consultation and we can discuss how to help the person who hoards in a collaborative manner. Because in every case it's different, the reasons behind hoarding and how to help. Right? And then the last point here is that studies have shown that hoarding and its degree of severity is directly linked to emotional insecurity, which arises from social isolation and a lack of resources be they financial, material, and emotional. So as we have mentioned before, right, for many people who hoard, their possessions are like their emotional security blanket. Hence, you do not want to clear their clutter without their permission or without giving them some alternative options or have some arrangements that will safeguard them from their distress, okay? An elderly lady called me once to describe the act of decluttering as creating a huge void inside of her. And she felt really empty and suicidal. And she very quickly went back to accumulating things to bring back her sense of security and comfort. And there was also once um, the residence committee at Upper Bunking called Ojoy Urgently uh, to help a lady who was on the verge of jumping down from her flat. Okay, this is after the town council decluttered her flat. Um, the councillor who went there managed to calm her down and send her to the hospital for assessment and we found out that she has dementia. So a person with dementia can be very vulnerable to false interventions like that, okay? Um, you can read out more about uh, her story and other stories that we have prepared and posted on our website. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Then there will be um, articles sharing about mental health, about hoarding, okay? Um, so if we want to, uh, know what is hoarding in the clinical sense, right? 
According to DSM-5 definition of hoarding, DSM-5 refers to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder. It is a, a book, a very sick book used by psychiatrists to diagnose a mental disorder. So hoarding is a mental disorder. Okay? It is defined as an excessive acquisition of objects and inability to discard or part with possessions that appear to have no value to others, leading to excessive clutter, distress, and disability. Okay, so if I ask you, uh, when you visit the house of a Kalanguni man, I don't know how many of you have visited the house of Kalanguni man, but uh, you tend to see a lot of things in their house, right? Piles of newspapers, cardboards, tin cans. Uh, maybe a week later you visit again, but the house is fairly empty, right? He has sold away his collections. So do you think that the Kalanguni man has a hoarding disorder? Uh, no, right? No, why not? Why not? Uh, there is no inability to discard with his possessions, okay? He's just collecting for his income, right? So technically, there's no hoarding behavior. So this inability to discard um, or part with possessions is important. Some elderly may have clutter in their house due to old age. They have no strength to tidy up. But if you offer to help them clear, they are willing to let you help them. So again, they have no issue, uh, no hoarding issue and they're unlikely to accumulate things after you help them to declutter. Okay, um, but here, a very important to note here, that the most important criteria for hoarding, okay, is that it causes significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, including maintaining a safe environment. Okay, so as you can see here, um, these are some of the consequences of causing significant impairment in functioning, right? Not being able to sleep in their bed, not able to sit in the living room, not even to cook in the kitchen. In some cases, they can't even step into the flat, right? And if you have landed property, it may interfere with the use of vehicles, the front and backyards, the workplace. Um, there is a range of health risks, including fire, falling, and poor sanitation. There's poor quality of life, right? and strained relationship with family, whether or not the family lives with the person who hoards. There are definitely threats to their own health and to the safety uh, extended to neighbours. Um, I have a lady with dementia who is starting to accumulate uh, clutter and mess in her studio apartment when I, first, uh, when I was first introduced to her. So her medications were all over the place. Some were expired, some were wrongly labelled. Uh, she has uh, hypertension and diabetes, and her health is deteriorating because she can't cook properly in her kitchen, and she has not been taking her medications regularly. So in her case, there's definitely a significant impairment in her daily functioning, but maybe not so much due to hoarding, but due to her dementia. So her hoarding behavior is only a symptom of her dementia. And to help her, we have to help her maintain her daily functioning Decluttering alone is not enough, and she is unlikely to learn skills to prevent decluttering in the future. So what she will need is um, help from service providers to keep her living environment clean and clutter-free. Okay, here's the next slide. There are more symptoms and behaviors, right, of hoarding. So on top there, inability to throw away possessions, severe anxiety when attempting to discard items. So this is very important to take note of, which is why when town council goes in to declutter and there's no one else there to support the elderly, the elderly can get into severe anxiety, can become suicidal. So it's very important when you're there to help to declutter. Some people, um, some, some of us must be there to, uh, to address their distress when it's happening. Okay, um, another symptom behavior is that they have great difficulty categorizing or organizing possessions. Um, there's an exception here is people with OCD tends to be quite organized. So their clutter is actually quite neat and tidy. But for rest of the hoarding uh, situations, it's usually very messy. Okay, um, indecision about what to keep or where to put things. Um, this one is very common. Okay, if you ask them, where do you want to keep? This, you know, they may say here, then later they will change their mind. Okay, then this part, distress. 
such as feeling overwhelmed or embarrassed by possession. This is very common. And because of this, right, because they are, they are aware that clutter causes, um, you know, that they are ashamed of their clutter most of the time. And therefore, they don't want people to visit their homes. So sometimes when we are being uh, referred a case with hoarding issue, we need to build rapport with the seniors over a few sessions like meeting them outside. You know, when they trust us enough, then maybe they will allow us to visit them at home. Okay, some of them may have suspicion of other people touching items. So here we have to be careful. If we are going into an elderly's home with a lot of clutter, it's very important for us not to go and touch their things. Okay. Um, it's important not to touch their things because once you are there touching their things, they will feel disrespected, especially without their permission, right? They will feel disrespected and if they cannot find some of the things, they may accuse you of stealing their things and then they will not allow you to return to their homes anymore. Okay, then there is uh, obsessive thoughts and actions, fear of running out of an item or of needing it in the future. Uh, they may check the trash for accidentally discarded objects. So I have an elderly with dementia. She likes to drink chicken essence, but she cannot remember how many, um, how much chicken essence she has at home. So her whole kitchen is filled up with boxes of uh, chicken essence because every time she goes out, she'll buy one or two boxes. Right? Um, and then the last point, right? Checking the trash for accidentally discarded objects. So um, one very important point to note is that when we're helping to declutter for seniors, it's very important to move the things away from where they live. Like you don't leave them outside the lift for the town council to collect. You don't put them at the void deck recycling bin because after you leave, they will go back and bring back those stuff that you put out, right? Okay, the last part, functional impairment. This is a repeat of just now. Okay, so I'll go on to the next slide. Okay, this is about um, whether hoarding is a mental um, disorder. So hoarding itself is a mental disorder. Um, but it can also manifest with other psychiatric conditions, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, major depressive disorder, acquisition-related impulse control disorder. This is when people can't control, they keep buying things. Um, generalized anxiety disorder, schizophrenia, and dementia. But it doesn't mean that um, as long as you have these disorders, you will definitely have hoarding. But hoarding can be a symptom of such um, mental conditions. Um, but as I've emphasized earlier, um, you can have clutter without having a mental condition like hoarding, right? Okay. Um, going on next to assessment. Okay, so um, how do we do assessment? Okay, usually we do interviews, we do home visits, we may take photographs, but um, photographs we have to take with their permission, okay? And they will only give permission if they trust us, if they know that we are on their side, we care about them, and we are not just going in there to do something because uh, the neighbors wanted the town council to clear their temper. Okay, uh, so this will uh, take a while. We may need to be very patient to gain their trust. Okay, and without having trust with the clients we help, right, there's no way we can help them in the long term. Okay, then the other assessment is that how do we measure their symptom severity? Okay, uh, we use the clutter image rating scale. Okay, there are actually many uh, assessment tools for measuring clutter, but uh, we use the clutter image rating scale because uh, it is actually uh, commonly used in Singapore. Like I learned about this uh, rating scale from the Agency of Integrated Care, AIC. They use this scale and said, therefore, um, when we uh, work with many agencies like HDB, Town Council, EIC, SAC, you know, um, we use the same scale and we can share a common language. So as you can see, right, the scale ranges from one to nine. Um, one means that there's no clutter and nine means that the clutter is very bad, right? So for example, if the HDB call us and tell us they have a hoarding problem with rating nine, we know that it's really, really bad. We need to engage more agencies. We may need to have more manpower when we are doing the decluttering. Okay, the couple with the two teenage sons, right? They are holding severities between four to five. So um, I think because they live in a five-room flat, there's more space for them to, you know, have things lying around. 
So we will we can still help them, but we don't need to involve HDB or town council. We actually engage the help of uh, Habitat for Humanity. So this is an organization that helps to um, 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 help with decluttering. And not just that, they also help with the reorganizing after the declutter. So they'll bring in shelves, they bring in uh, cupboards, I mean, um, cupboards to help the person um, sort out the, the things. Yeah. And then, as you can see, there's rating one to three. Um, rating one, there's no clutter, right? And um, rating two and three usually could happen um, when the person is not feeling well or their life's very busy, they don't have time to you know, tidy up. But very soon, we will go back to rating one. So for rating one to three, there's no interventions necessary. Yeah. And then, um, Besides looking at the severity of the clutter, we also need to do risk assessment, right? We need to know if there's any uh, one of the following, like fire hazard, clutter avalanche, infestations are very important. So the flat could be filled with bed bugs, um, cockroaches, rats, ants, and if there is infestations, it's important for us to engage the pest control to um, get rid of the infestations after the decluttering. This is before we bring in things like clean furniture and so on. Okay, there could also be unsanitary living conditions, um, such as uh, there is uh, urine everywhere or feces everywhere. So the cleanup will have to be quite major, right? And then we have to also assess whether there is the presence of other vulnerable persons, okay, those with low IQ, those with um, dementia, and we need to know how to help those um, with vulnerabilities like that. Okay, then going, moving forward to interventions. So is clean up the only solution, right? As you can see before, it's like that, you know, and then after it's quite amazing, right? Is that all? Is that all we need to do? Okay, obviously, as I've said so many times, no, it's not a good idea. Um, I mean, alone, doing it alone is not a good idea. So a study done in 2001 shows that cleans up alone is not a good idea. It may resolve the issue temporarily, but it comes back half the time, right? There's no change. Or 15% of the time, it becomes worse because actually the decluttering becomes a very traumatic event for the elderly and they become um, more insecure afterwards. Okay, so the decluttering worsens. Okay, so what is helpful? Okay, how do we intervene? First of all, we need to understand the psychology of hoarding. Why do people hoard? Okay, so this is a cognitive behavioral model of hoarding. And then you can see that there are many aspects of hoarding we need to consider, right? And each person will have a different map. So under the vulnerability factors, we have the ability to possess information. We also have um, early experiences like core beliefs, personality, mood, core mobility. So for example, persons with dementia or with traumatic brain injury, they have deficits in information processing uh, area. And uh, it is likely that most of them will not be able to regain their ability to organize and sort. So service providers need to go in and help them organize and sort on a regular basis afterwards to maintain the environment, okay? Um, a person with depression, for example, will not have the energy and the mood to do the cleanup. A person with paranoia, will be very uh, you know, suspicious of you if you touch their things. A uh, person with trauma, you will need to do some work to build up a different form of safety net before they will allow you to remove their possessions, right? Okay, we also need to understand their beliefs and attachment. Um, for a lot of people um, who accumulate things, um, they find that it's a waste to throw things away. So even if they can't use those things themselves, they want to keep in case they can use those things or they want to recycle those things, yeah? And then um, there's a lady who keeps a lot of uh, kitchen utensils that her mother used to use. Her mother has already passed away. So basically she, she's keeping them for sentimental value, right? It's a way of remembering her mother. Then um, there's this, um, gentleman in his 20s with compulsive obsessive disorder. He keeps a lot of magazines and he tells me that he wants to read all the articles in the magazines 
uh, before he applied for his job. Okay, he has no job after NS, you know, so he's in a very um, um, lost state, but he doesn't feel secure enough to um, get a job without having enough knowledge. Yeah. And then, um, then of course, you remember the case whereby the elderly wants to leave all his personal recordings as a legacy to his grandchildren. So for him, right, he may have some pride and pleasure associated with his possessions. Okay, um, here are some of the basic CBT elements for hoarding disorder. So number one is therapeutic alliance. Okay, without therapeutic alliance, which is the rapport between um, you and your client, we can't do anything. Okay, they need to know that we care about them, we are on their side, and we understand where they're coming for, from, and um, everything that we're doing for them is for their sake, for their well-being. Okay. Once we have that therapeutic alliance, we can work on other things like enhancing willingness to change through psychoeducation, motivational enhancement, applying appropriate pressures and incentives. So basically, we need to understand their values and goals in life, what is important for them, why cleanup will result in a better life for them, and what will happen if they do not clean up. Okay, we can do psychoeducation on the consequences. So for example, the couple with dementia and traumatic brain injury, the way I motivate them to have a cleanup is by getting the two teenage boys involved, okay? The teenage boys previously wasn't able to take charge because they are, you know, um, the parents are the one in charge, right? So basically, we get them to speak up and let the parents know that they want a better living environment. They want to be able to study well in the living environment. They want to invite their friends to the house. Also, the couple themselves wants to hold fellowship meetings, you know, with their church meets at their homes. So with that, when we're doing the clearing and the organizing, right, we always bring up these motivations to keep them going, right? Okay, subsequently, we can train some people um, in the skills in sorting and organizing, decision making and so problem solving. Okay, I said some because, um, you know, a lot of times uh, elderly with dementia or yeah, usually elderly with dementia will not be able to be trained in this. Okay, the fourth point, practice sorting, organizing, and discarding. So before the actual cleanup, the actual major cleanup, it's very important to practice, you know, practice with them in a small way, what is going to happen during the actual decluttering. You know, you can bring boxes. Um, this is the one to keep. Here is the one you want to throw. Here is, here is the box where, where you put everything you want to donate. And because um, a lot of them value um, treasuring the, the, the use of um, objects, uh, they will be okay to donate. You know, the, usually the donating power will be quite a lot. And uh, the, the, the power where they keep is very important. You help them to find all the things they want to keep and put it in a safe place before the actual decluttering happens. Because when the actual decluttering happens, it can be quite messy and a lot of things will get in get thrown away without actually the person being asked. Yeah, so it's important to prepare them for that. And then subsequently, you want to restrict acquiring. So you need to understand why they are acquiring, right? And then replace it with certain options, you know? So for example, the guy with the OCD who collects recyclable plastics, he actually brings them home, wash them, dry them, clean them, and then place them in recycling bins. So uh, one of the options we give to him is that instead of bringing them home, for those that are actually quite clean, uh, just place them immediately in the recycling bin. Then the last one, cognitive restructuring for beliefs, right? Um, for example, the lady with the mother's belongings, uh, she's keeping a lot of the utensils um, because her belief is that this is my way of showing my filial piety. This is my way of showing my loyalty to my mom. You know, if I throw them away, it's equivalent to forgetting my mom or betraying my mother. So we need to work with her on remembering her mother in a different way. Okay, we can help her talk about their, her past experiences with her mother, uh, let her realize that her mother lives in her heart, in her memories, and not in her belongings. We can choose to keep one item and donate the rest away, uh, maybe to a museum, whereby it can be of use to the future generation. 
um, if we have time, we can do a scrapbook together with the photos and to include the stories of her mother inside. So in the end, she just needs to keep one scrapbook instead of all the kitchen utensils. Okay, um, motivation enhancement. So I've uh, covered some of this. Um, hoarding as an obstacle to live in accordance with values and achieve goals. So, uh, for example, we have an elderly man, right, um, with, with uh, clutter issues. Uh, he's the one whereby he, his flat is so filled with clutter that uh, when you open the door, you can only open 45 degrees, and then you can't even step into the flat. So for him, the counsellor realised that his goal actually is to be able to sleep inside his flat and actually use his flat for his living. Because uh, for many months, he has been sl sleeping at white decks, right? So keeping the clutter and decluttering is, is an obstacle to his goal of living properly. Moreover, um, if he does not declutter, right, HDB will not let him continue to rent his flat. So he has to live in a sheltered home, which he doesn't want to. So with this one, is, um, with this case, it's quite easy to help the person be motivated to do the clearing. Okay, and then here's setting specific plans and empowering patients to implement them. Okay, so when we set specific plans, right, we will need to do it with them. We do the sorting together with them, especially with seniors, help them to make decisions, what to keep, what to donate, what to throw. Okay, um, basically we can't just teach them and leave them to do it themselves. It will be too much for them, right? Okay, um, sometimes if we can't do a lot, we can do, we can start small, you know, be specific. We do the SMART goals, like specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So, for example, with the lady with dementia, I have uh, worked with her. I, I tell her, for the next three hours, let's clear this table and let's try to find all your medications in the house, okay? Once we have all the medications there, we will look at which ones are expired, which one is wrongly labeled, we will label them correctly, so on. You know, and then we throw away the expired medication. So the goal is that she wants to stay healthy so that she can continue to participate in community activities, right? She likes to attend English classes. She likes to go to um, drawing classes. She enjoys calligraphy. So all this require a healthy body, you know? So she needs to be able to take her medication and be healthy, stay healthy, okay? Okay, I'm going a bit fast because of the timing. Um, this is a very, very important concept when it comes to change. Okay, people don't realize that change can take place over five stages. So even before you go to the action stage, right, whereby you're doing the decluttering, there are actually three stages beforehand. Um, the pre-contemplation stage is when the person doesn't even think about dropping, hoarding as a problem, you know, uh, uh, um, decluttering. Okay, and then uh, the content state is when they finally recognize that hoarding is a problem and then they start to seriously consider stopping hoarding okay but they are not yet committed to taking any definite action then the next stage preparation is when they have made the decision to stop and they start to make some plans to drop the hoarding okay so um, it takes time to move a person from the pre-contemplation to the contemplation to the preparation and finally for the action so you know, dealing with people with hoarding issue is not, you don't expect quick actions or fast actions, okay? It needs to go through stages. Um, so with regards to the, the elderly man that I, I shared earlier, um, the town council was actually alerted to the fire hazard by his neighbour. And uh, this town council was wiser than the other town council. Um, they actually alerted Odroy first and uh, wanted us to go through the first three stages before they do the decluttering. So the, the counselor was able to walk the man through the five stages. And uh, during the cluttering, the counselor was there to you know, comfort him when he, if, if she should experience any distress. And then subsequently, the counselor visited him and uh, checked that he doesn't further accumulate objects. So the man was actually very happy that he is able to sleep inside his flat and he never cluttered up his flat afterwards. Yeah, so that was a successful story. Um, but however, to be honest with you, not all cases will get to act, uh, stage four or five. Sometimes things will happen before and then um, we cannot get there. Sometimes we may not even be able to move from pre-contemplation to contemplation stage.
So the last slide I have, actually I'm not going to go into details about this slide. I'm just going to share that um, with IMH, they also do an eight-step plan for hoarding. Okay, this is used by IMH and it's a model that's adopted from the UK. So basically, you can see here uh, on the right-hand side that there's actually eight steps to the whole process. And step four, only step four is the clearing sessions. Okay, so there are preparation steps one to three, and then after that, there were maintenance um, um, steps, steps five to eight. So, um, okay, um, so I hope that this, all this information is helpful for you to know more about hoarding. And now it's my turn to pass the stage to my colleague Fiona to share a case study with you. Um, because this case study may contain some details that are specific to the client, I would like um, you all to know where they're coming from and understand what they want with their life. And then you can work with that um, to help to see if you, know, you all can come to some compromise. Yeah. Um, if you are still not very sure how to help, then you can maybe give us a call. We can have a phone call, phone conversation, or we can choose to meet up and discuss. So it's like a consultation session. Um, and then you can maybe, it will be easier for you to uh, describe what's going on and for us to give you more detailed um, intervention methods maybe. Hoarding was a very um, insightful one. And I feel that uh, there's a lot that uh, we can do and uh, learn from all these sharings. So uh, do follow Ojoy social media and their website. Just check out their website because there's a lot of other information they have, uh, not just related to hoarding, but on senior care. And um, our you can check out their previous sharing on uh, anxiety and depression in seniors too. 